And we're back with another episode of Diamond Download. Jay's happy Tuesday, but it's Friday for everybody else. How you doing? Dude, I'm great. Just got this new microphone. I'm stoked. I'm, I'm excited to have good quality audio, hopefully. Oh, you got a new microphone? Yeah, yeah, you're looking at it. I think I copied you. Is this the one that you had? You know what I got that's new? You got a new apartment, right? <laughs> that's Miami. Down there, all the way down there. You can, I, I understand. You can probably barely see it, but no, it's down there somewhere. Bro, it literally looks like you're in the sky. Are you are you in the same building or new building? No, brand new building. So this is I you know that line from Shrek where it's like they're talking about Princess Fiona and how she's in the highest room in the tallest tower? Yeah. That's me. There's 85 floors. I don't mind dogs myself. The security in this building is so good. Try and come and get me, bro. Come and get me. <laughs> 85 floors on Panorama. I'm on the 85th floor. It does not get better than this. This is the, the tallest building in the whole city. And I can see everything. So cool. I can see so you. Cool. I, your house from here bro yeah congratulations brother that's that's amazing only thing is I, I don't have a desk so i'm currently sitting on my couch with no mic recording this thing so i hope you can hear me all right yeah yeah, yeah. no it looks great that's that's so cool well i'm pumped to chat today i feel like it's been a while even though i think it was last week but it feels like it's been a long time no it's only been seven days but i you just missed me is that what you're saying yeah yeah, yeah. let's do it <laughs> i know you've got i know you got some great topics and by the way i saw were you in a helicopter this weekend before we start i was yeah it was my one year with my my lovely Mrs. Cardinal. Congratulations. Happy one year. Thanks, man. They should get an antsy. Dude, these Latinas, man, they want to get married after a couple of weeks knowing you. So like, <laughs> it's been a full year now. She doesn't have a ring. She's starting to freak out a little bit, but it's all right. Oh, man. Um, anyway, yeah, no, let's jump into this stuff. So we got, we got some cool topics today. Let's start with the first one, which is why are big businesses big? And you spend a ton of time around like nine and possibly 10 figure brands like these these you know crazy massive clients that i'm sure you've worked with or at least spoken to and i don't have a ton of experience working with like big businesses but like it's always fascinated me like the difference between like a seven or low eight figure econ brand versus like a high eight to mid nine figure econ brand like or whether it's agencies or like some other thing i'm super curious on your insights as to what makes a business that size that big? Why is it so big? What happens there? Yeah, it's a good question. I think it's uh, three things. I think number one is you just have like a relentless, ruthless entrepreneur, right? I think it's driven by a type A person that just will not fail. Like Failure is not in their vocabulary. They don't know what failure is like, at least in that business, right? They probably failed in the past, which has made them just have like this burning desire to win. But I think number one is just like the entrepreneur is hungry and they're hungry not for a base hit but they're hungry for a home run or a grand slam but i think number one is the the entrepreneur right it's like when you're riding you're kind of betting on a horse rate like you're betting on the jockey really right like who is the jockey that has the determination and has been putting in the reps to to win the race i think that's number one i think number two um along with the entrepreneur i think they have some kind of competitive advantage uh, whether that be you know starting seven years ago when facebook ads were easy and just scaling it like nobody's business. And they just built a huge list and a huge community, a bunch of trust and goodwill that like, you know, seven, 10 years later, they're still crushing it, even though Facebook's harder. Um, or, you know, right now, when you're talking a lot about TikTok shop, it's the people that are just dominating TikTok shop. Like that's their unfair advantage is they know how to acquire traffic um, at zero cost up front or virtually no cost up front. Um, and they just know how to build systems for acquisition and retention that are just different and better. They know something that we don't know. I think on every social platform, I think every business owner, you know, every influencer, whatever it is, there's 1% of people that know something that we don't. And whatever it is that they know and that they're doing, that's their unfair competitive advantage. And then I think number three, it's also being able to hire and attract and retain A players. It's bringing in just savages. It's bringing in people that can do the work that complement the things that you can do and staying out of their way and not micromanaging. So, you know, to round that out, it's, you know, a type or entrepreneurs, a team and exploiting or doubling down on some kind of competitive advantage that um, other people aren't pushing as hard on. And they just know that there's a finite period of time that they have to double down and, and do this. And they're just going a thousand miles per hour while everyone else is maybe going 10 or 50 or a hundred. Hmm. Interesting. Um, so, okay. So I, yeah, I was, I, I definitely understand the thing about the entrepreneur and I've met people like that. You, you definitely like 
met some crazy people where it's like i understand yeah. why this guy's successful i've i've met like psychopaths that like okay dude whatever you do you're gonna be successful it just happens to be the best product um the unfair advantage thing i think is interesting the reason that i was thinking about this was because i saw some guy tweet this it was um he was talking about a, a business it's a shopify it, like basically a dropship thing i don't know if it's dropship it's a brand that does 13 okay. mil a month um wow. selling it's trees See if I can find this. I'm like going through my likes. Ah, now. I don't know who posted that. I did see that on my feed. I don't know who posted that or or when it was, but it was in the past what three to seven days. I saw that too. I didn't read it though. Yeah, I saw the first a couple of days. Print. And um, yeah, and it was just because it's it's such a strange business. Like it's just trees. You're selling like tree seeds. Um, but like I don't know if you knew anything about like, you know that business though. Do you know what they were talking about? No, I saw like the first tweet of the thread. Basically, I read the headline. I didn't read any of the body. Yeah, but like, I've always wondered like what kind of holds people back. Like, I feel like if there's a if there's a business that can get to like ten mil a year, like, is it that unlikely that I could get to, you know, a hundred? Like, what is it? Just like ad spend, or like, what are people actually doing? Like, what is the difference? Yeah, I think you kind of said it too. Like, I think the fourth one I would have added was great product. It's like great entrepreneur, great team, competitive advantage, um, and just great product. Maybe the product, the competitive advantage, but I typically think of competitive advantage of the ability to acquire and retain customers uh, cheaper or better, right? Some kind of marketing, you know, superpower. Um, I think the difference between a one, ten, hundred million dollar business, um, a lot of times is, yeah, some coefficient of like spend and acquisition. And also too, like how how big is the market, right? Like, are you building into a market that already exists and has demand, or are you creating something net new? I think something net new in the beginning kind of has a smaller market cap, but as you spend more and as you raise awareness and as it grows, and even as there's more players, it obviously expands. Um, not that this would be like the best example, right? But like, you know, you kind of have like hotels, and then you had Airbnb, right? Like Airbnb was basically pulling from like people's travel budgets, which was predominantly going to hotels, hostels, that type of things. Um, but so initially I think Airbnbs, maybe they were capped just because of their own lack of awareness, but they built the category, right? The same thing with like Uber, they basically stole from like taxis. So I think if you're building something that has demand in a tangent industry, it can be a really big industry. Um, and then I think if you're like really early, like on a trend, like some kind of health trend, I think there's some kind of cap in the beginning. And then as the market matures and grows, yeah, it could be a, a 10 million business that turns into a hundred million business. So I think like all of these levels of sophistication, the market opportunity, kind of the, the TAM, right? The, the total addressable market, all of those things factor in. That's good to know. Have you, you so going back to the founder thing, um, have you spoken to any, founders in particular where like after a conversation you're like there's no wonder why you're doing so well like you definitely talked to some like nine figure econ brand or before right yeah my buddy um eric that owns bill i think he started it in maybe yeah. 2017 um so about seven years in and um i can't give away the exact numbers but they're doing somewhere between low to mid nine figures a year in revenue i don't know i don't know what their profit was and if i did obviously couldn't share but um they're they're doing low to nine low to mid nine figures a year and when I talked to him, right, like he had a previous e-commerce business before that. Um, it was this company called Privacy Pop, where it's basically like a tent for um, a room. So for siblings or I think also to actually like a lot of kids like with autism, like it, there was a lot of interesting use cases, but it was kind of this cool product. I think he had scaled that to about three to five million dollars or, or five to ten million dollars a year. So he kind of got his feet wet, got the experience. And at the time that he started the company he did, um, you know, it was optimal timing on social, right? Like he just, he knew Facebook and Instagram better than anyone else. And he just doubled down and dominated that. He had a really interesting influencer play. He was okay, you know, breaking even or losing a little bit of money on just being with every influencer. Like I think he got every bachelor influencer like in the world that was someone to like do his product. Now he's working with like athletes and celebrities like Mike Tyson or whatever. Um, so I think he's just been like on or ahead of trends. And he, he hustles. Like, I mean, dude, this dude still works. Uh, I think he's having a fun summer. But, I mean, up until the past couple of months, this guy was working 14, 16 hours a day, oftentimes seven days a week. So it's like he's just putting in the sheer amount of man hours and manpower 
And he just has the experience and the reps from his previous business and he just timed it perfectly. So I think a little bit of luck, a lot of it being him being a great person. Um, and he picked a great product. Like everyone needs to buy shirts and sh pants and shorts and socks. So he just started, he started with like nailing the basics. It's called built basics. He nailed the basics, like, which I think was t-shirts and boxer briefs. Then he just expanded the category to sunglasses, shoes, pants, you know, tank tops, jackets. Like he now has everything and now he's doing women. So I just think he just nailed one or two things, figured that out really, really well at a great product. And then just sold more things to the same customers and increased the lifetime value. Bro, like people are obsessed. Like um, a lot of people use my discount code, like my brothers. I don't know if you, you ever have, but you know, Nick does. Um, I get emails all the time. Like I'd say my brothers and Nick, people are probably ordering like once a month. It's like, it's a little bit of, you know, excessive, but people just buy. So the lifetime value is really high. Like you're a customer for life, really. Interesting. It's really tough to be in the everything category. You know what I mean? Like they're selling yeah. every piece of clothing. That's tough. Um, like there's a, a lot they're competing with. I think like, especially like just like blank t-shirts. Like how do you convince someone to buy one of your t-shirts? There's nothing on it. It doesn't stand like clothing is hard enough. Even if it's cool clothing, like you're, you're asking someone to buy a white t-shirt and you're probably doing like a couple million a year per SKU of like the most random piece of clothing. I think that takes some sort of like marketing genius. They're like yes. um, true classic. They've done that really well. What's the other one? There's like two of those besides Bill. Uh, there's like True Classic. There's Cuts. I don't know. There's like a bunch of these. Cuts. cuts. Yeah. So like, yeah, the fact that they've been able to do that, like I think that's probably one of the toughest like verticals yeah. to end, and they figured it Bro, out. They're competing with like Viore is a really big one. They're competing with Lululemon. Like they're competing in we're, some we're, regards with like Nike and some of their products. Like, like in that category, you're competing with, yeah, anyone that sells a t-shirt that is of or similar price points or even even lower or cheaper. So it's a really hard one, um, but he's done, he's done a really great job. It's just like, not that he was first to market, but he he was first to doing it the way that he was doing it. I think Cuts and some of these other ones came after him. I'm not too sure about Viore, kind of where, where they were in it. But yeah, I mean, his goal was to do a billion dollars in revenue um, within 10 years of the company, like a billion dollars a year in revenue. He had set a five-year goal. He crushed it. Um, his five-year goal is like to do nine figures. He, he crushed past that goal. And his next goal, which would be your five and 10 is to do a billion dollars a year in revenue. Whether he gets there, I'm not really sure. He's not really someone I want to bet against. So I'm going to bet with him, but pretty insane if he can get there. Are they retail? So he, he has actually, he opened up a store in uh, Newport beach at a place called fashion Island. And he opened up his own store and he opened up one, I think in Scottsdale. So I think he has like two or three flagship locations of his own. And everything else, I think, is pretty much his own stuff online. I don't know if he sells in Nordstrom's or elsewhere, but um, I think it's just direct to consumer primarily. Interesting. Tell him to open one up in Miami and I'll be the store manager. <laughs> cool. Yeah, let no, him know. Tell him I need 40 bucks an hour minimum. I will not go on to 40 bucks an hour. And I cool. want to wear whatever I want. I don't want to wear the uh, a uniform. I want to just wear built clothes. Cool. Yeah, sold. Okay. <laughs> okay, dope. Next one. Um, The best money well spent so the whole point about this one is not about whether you spent 20 bucks and got something great or you spent okay. two grand or got something great it's about like anytime you spent money and like it the value that you got out of it was like so much further than like what you actually spent i have two examples go for it i mean oh yeah all right so <clears throat> like i just finished talking about at the beginning i just moved and it was kind of a dumb move because like every time I've moved before in my life, like it's either been like between different cities, like completely different cities or different countries. Like when I came down to Miami and I can see the building that I left down this. <laughs> and like I was just putting off moving so much because it was like I thought it was gonna be such a minimal thing, but it was gonna be so much work. Like I have a lot of stuff now. I just I. I'm an Amazon addict. And so I just like every day I'm adding a couple of things to my cart, just cashing up. <laughs> and so I was like, dude, I have so much stuff. It's going to take me forever. And so I just put it off. My moving day was literally a month ago. And so I decided I was going to like pay for the best movers, which is the one that Ben's, uh, the ones that Ben got, because Ben just moved here too. And oh, nice. I pay my maid to like basically pack up everything in boxes and like bring it over here. So she showed up at 10 a.m on thursday 
and just got to work. Bro, I asked her to buy a bunch of boxes because I didn't want to go and go to Home Depot <laughs> and like buy. So I like I sent her money for boxes. This lady does not speak any English, but her and I like I'm speaking Spanish, like using our hands, communicating back and forth, like what I need, what I don't need. I paid her a thousand dollars to pack up my entire life in the the other building and bring it here. And bro, I was fully moved into this place, except for the fact that I'm sitting on a couch with no microphone, no desk, in like 12 hours. It was or less than that. It was like Same. nine hours. It was crazy. For a thousand dollars, I didn't have to do a single thing. I had to work. I had stuff to do. And so I was kind of like just on my laptop. I was doing kind of supervising, bro, a grand to do something that I would have never done myself. I would have never, ever in a million years sat there with a bunch of boxes, going to get the boxes, coming back, packing it all up, like labeling it. Never. But she did this. And dude, I, I just remember thinking, I was like, I can't believe that that just cost me $1,000. Like, because in my head, like I would have paid $10,000 10. Yeah. To, to not have to do all that stuff. And she set everything up perfectly and it looks amazing. And I'm like, I'm like, thank God for Mariella. So yeah. That, the level of stress that you basically got to put on her shoulders versus yours for a thousand bucks, like you, you might have just saved yourself three months of your life or a year of your life, just or or maybe you save yourself three months of paying two two rents because you were just putting it off for longer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so that was a that was a big one yes. for me. But what you have one? Uh, I I have one or two, but you, it sounds like you had two. Do you have one more? I'll go after you. I want to hear you first. Okay. Yeah, this is kind of a silly one, but um, when I went to go film that thing a couple weeks ago, I was planning on driving to LA, and then last minute I was like, "I'm just gonna Uber." And my wife's like, "No, just hire like a driver." So we like hired a driver. They came, they showed up, right? Like, you scheduled a ride. They were so kind. Like, they had a bunch of great cars, and they were very safe. And like, the round trip was like three and a half, four hours. So it was like an hour forty-five, two hours each way, uh, separated by, by a couple of days. And, you know, a couple hundred dollars that I spent on just being able to relax and chill and not sit in traffic and be able to like work. Um, that was great. Like it just was nice luxury peace of mind. I hate traffic. I hate driving to LA. It was just great to not have to like stress or worry about that and just spend a little bit of money to, to make that happen. So like that for me was like one that happened a few weeks ago where I was kind of debating, do I do it? Do I not do it? You know, I can easily do it. And looking back, I'm like, damn, anytime I'm going to do anything like that again, I'm just going to have a driver. Like why, why not? So that was a, a little kind of a convenient one where I got a bunch of work done. So I was way less stressed um, on both rides up. Wait, but why, why that over Uber? Um, I was going to do an Uber and my wife was just like, hey, you get like a get someone that actually drives for like a living and like these nice cars, you know, whatever. And so you could have done like the Uber SUV or whatever. But her dad right. has like this driving company he uses um, that we take like to the airports and whatnot. So she just feels like they're they, they basically they're very familiar. Like her dad's been using them for a long time. So she really trusts them. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I don't know. I was, I was going to Uber and she kind of pushed me to doing the driver thing just gotcha. because she's like, they're safe. Like, I don't know if she was worried. They've got like great cars, new cars. Right. So it was just like a little bit, I paid more than I would if I Ubered, but not by much. Okay. Cause I was going to say that what you're saying kind of ties into my second one where it's like, because you, you have a relationship with the person, you know what I mean? Like the driver, like they yes. know you, they like you. Um, you know they're going to take care of you. Yes. Because you're using them, you have that loyalty with them. I think that is something super worth investing in. Because like if you're going to spend 100 bucks a trip on an Uber anyway, and it's going to be a different person every time, it makes way more sense to just have like someone that you know like pull up and just like kind of you're like they're your driver. Like that personalization. Yeah. Bro, they dress, they dress nice. They bring like water and snacks. Like my dad's, or uh, my father-in-law's friends with the owner. So it was like the relationship. And then also to like my wife, whatever reason wanted me to use them. And she's just felt more comfortable. So I could have done like the Uber, you know, SUV, but you get someone random. Like these people are all like background check. They're all vetted. There's only like eight or 10 drivers on staff. So, you know, chances are I might've had them in the past. I got the dr same driver up and back. Right. So it's like, you know, he kind of gets to know you. They, they have you just answer a couple questions like, do you want to chat with the driver? What kind of music do you want? What temperature do you like? So it just very felt like custom and specific to like what I wanted. And I was just like, hey, I'm going to work um, in the car. I don't really care about music, um, right? Like I like water, like whatever, right? Like they ask what kind of beverage do you want? So it just felt like, yeah, like they made an effort to customize it to me where with Uber, 
I could have had the best driver or the worst driver, right? I know I didn't really want to roll the dice. Yeah. <laughs> no, dude, the next step on top of that, and we've done this a handful of times, probably five or six times, me and the boys, and if we have like a big party, we'll get a sprinter. Yep. You, ever, you ever ridden a sprinter? Yeah, for um for our Hawaii trip like a few months ago, we from the same company, we rented a sprinter huh. for, I don't know, it was like, and, and that's the cool, cool thing too, through this company, through Uber, like it's hard to get car seats. Um, like, you, like whether they have a car seat or not, it's really hard. So through this company, last time we went to the airport, we rented a Sprinter van. We told them we needed four car seats. They installed the car seats, right? Like, they, we didn't have to worry about anything. So, yeah, yeah. Like, doing the Sprinter van is sick. My wife took the Sprinter van to Taylor Swift with some friends. They're, those are nice. Yeah. Yeah, dude, because you can pile as many people as you want in there. I don't know <laughs> if, like, when you were taking that one to the airport, if you had the one with the stripper pole in it, but, like, you can get one with a stripper pole if you want. No, I don't think we did. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I think we did. We had a bunch of little kids. No, it was a family trip. Um, but what gotcha. what was your second one? I want to hear about. Is it is it the Sprinter van? This one? No. Um, but that that's definitely a good one. I was yeah. okay. So I I went to dinner last night. It was me, Ben, my sales manager Philip, and a friend of ours that we haven't seen in a while. His name's Grant. He was here last summer. Grant's like one yeah. of the coolest dudes ever. I think I probably told you about it before. And so, we went to Gecko, and. We go to the same places a lot in Miami. Like a lot of people think like, bro, you live in like the best city for food. Like, why do you go to the same 10 spots over and over and over? It's because you invest in certain places and you invest in the staff and you can literally make a restaurant that's like a nice restaurant feel like home away from home. Yeah. And so Gecko is, it's one of the Grutman spots. Dave Grutman is like one of the, yep. you know, Dave Grutman? Yeah, he's like, doesn't he own the top two clubs in Miami and a bunch of like the hotels and stuff? He owns everything. Yeah, he owns a bunch yeah. of clubs. He owns a bunch of restaurants. Gecko in particular is the one that I think he owns with Bad Bunny. And I think Leo DiCaprio's in there. They, they raise yeah. money from a bunch of stuff so they can say they own a restaurant. But anyway. That's um, it. Messi was there a couple nights ago. It's a great, it's a great spot. But Dang. somehow, me and my squad, we're like top cut. Like we get treated like royalty there because, because of this is what I did. So. I went, I went there with my girl a couple of times. All right. Yeah. We, we go there once in a while. And like, we had this one server, his name was Anton and he was the boy took such good care of us. Was so nice. Like was super, like just good at his job. And I remember I probably tipped like 200% or something ridiculous. Cause it was like a smaller bill. I think it was like, you know, 200 bucks, but like I'll throw a big tip sometimes if I nice. think it's it. And so I did that. And so we went there yesterday. And I didn't see my boy. I didn't see Anton, but I saw someone that kind of looked like him. It was one of his friends. And so we're waiting for our table. We're standing at the bar. Bartender is like, "Hey, yeah, yeah, you, whatever you like. Can I use my ID?" We're pulling out our ideas and that our IDs. And then the other server, who I'd never seen before, was like, "Yo, these are my friends. Like, take good care of them." Bartender like no longer needs the IDs. Starts making drinks. And then, um, wow, so it wasn't even the guy you tipped. It was the the guy's friend that you tipped. You left yeah. a bunch of impression. Exactly. And so, and then the dude, the drinks were free. They were on the house because we made a joke. Like we, we like, I was going to offer him one. I was, I was going to say like, do they let you drink on shift? And then he was like, oh no, like we could. And then there was an incident at a Christmas party where like one of the servers got too drunk and then they took that away for everybody. And I was like, oh man, then we started riffing on that, just making jokes. And then we got him laughing. And then so between the social proof and the other server who we didn't even ever tip and the bartender, our drinks were on the house. And so obviously like I tipped the bartender, like I'm not going to let him miss out on that. So I, I threw him like 80 bucks just for being the homie. And then, dude, we, we ended up, we got another round of free drinks, dinner, and a free dessert. And it was like all because I tipped one dude one time really well. Crazy and like, I remember that though. Like, yeah, it's crazy. And so like, I think, and I have another restaurant called Novikov where I had the same sort of thing. Just like take care of all the servers and they really take care of you. Like you have priority over everyone. And that to me, even if I don't make the money back, even if it's not like, you know, like a, a round of free drinks, like that's maybe 60 bucks. Like it's not the same as the tip that I gave to the first guy, but it doesn't matter because like, I love the feeling of being prioritized at a restaurant or yeah. a club, or a bar or anything. And just like feeling like they really want me to be there. Cause that's so rare in Miami. Like if especially you're not- yes, Especially in Miami, especially when you're competing yeah. with the likes of DiCaprio and Messi and Brady, right? Yes, dude. Like. They don't want to take care of you. Like, there's some places that they're still like that. Even if you tip them well, like, they're going to, they don't care about you. You know what I mean? You're just a yeah. dollar to them. But at some of these places, bro, like, you can, you can invest in the staff and they will pay you back 
tenfold just with like acts of service. It's beautiful. Do you, do you feel like you are that way because you used to work in the restaurants like because you know the other side? Like, does that do anything for you? It definitely makes me more understanding of like when something goes wrong. Yeah. Um, but I was not a, as good of a server as these guys. Yeah. I just, I, I just know because I've been here long enough, like been here almost two years that like, the, if you're going to spend money on anything in Miami, it's like, if you were planning on spending 150 K on a car and you already have a decent car, like literally put that towards like tipping staff and like investing in people and you will have a way better time than if you just had a really cool car. Like yeah. It, so it sounds crazy, like 150K, like obviously not that much, but like there's nothing that you can do that's better than like making connections with people at top spots because it's just yeah. a, like, it makes your entire experience in the city better. It's like if you were in high school, right? Like I wasn't super popular in high school, but I know the people who were popular in high school like had a way better time than me. <laughs> and like, if you can kind of buy popularity outside of like, you know, high school's 2,000 people, Miami's 2 million. Like if you can kind of buy clout, that's so much better. Like your whole life changes. It's it's unreal. That's cool. Heck yeah. Dude, that's a great one. All right, let's do the third one. That was a that was a great second one. Yeah, thanks, man. All right. Um, the last one is uh Mason Biz update. So we always do a LinkedIn biz update. But like I, I just realized I've I've never really talked about anything that I do. Does your audience no, yeah, I wanna I wanna hear. Catch catch me because you've been obviously doing a lot. So okay. So we have somehow gone like basically a year and a half or more than that. Like when you, when it was you and me almost two years now with no paid. Um, and, and I it just been organic, like between you and me, four copy of EA generated like eight plus million dollars in the time that we started or since we started. So now we're transitioning to paid. Um, and dude, like from what we're seeing, like early signs, like this is really good. <laughs> like we're seeing a lot of crazy numbers. Like I have never been a big believer in ads just because like, I don't know. I just don't understand it well enough. Yeah. But, like we're at a, we're at a two and a half X it really depends on the week. Like last yeah. week we were at like a, we were at like a four X, but so right now we're trying this this funnel that we apparently is just like Garen fucking teed to work on ads. Um, so Griffin and I are both in this program called fast forward from this guy named Alan Sultanic. Do you know who that is? I think I'm in like one of his Facebook groups or something. I don't know him personally, but I think I'm in a Facebook group that he has. Oh, you might be an NHB. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds familiar. I don't, I don't participate, but I think I joined it like five years ago or four years ago and I've never done anything with it, but I've seen the name. Okay. So Alan Sultanic is one of the greatest direct response marketers that we have available or access to like the, the top, top guys, like you'll never even know who they are, but he's, he's nice enough to give himself a Twitter account and a course where you can actually learn from him. And okay. so we're both in fast forward. It's his program. And there's this whole model of like building a funnel that he has, um, where like basically no matter what, as long as your ads don't completely suck, like the funnel's going to crush. So if anyone wants to go look at it, I don't really care. It's, um, you just go to copyme.com slash four, like F O R dash dummies. That's the one. And so you can see how, like, we have like a uh, way four dummies. Four dummies. Yeah. We have a $27 product that we see right on the front page, which is the VSL for, and then a 197 thing, and then a downsell to a $97 thing if they don't take the 197. And then they get dialed by my guys and emailed by me. And then the goal is to basically send them to the coaching thing. Um, the thing with the funnel and the whole point is you need a couple of things, right? So the products that you're actually selling for the low ticket need to be so insanely valuable that like people think like, oh my God, like this is insane. I can't imagine what the, the $5,000 thing costs. And we've accomplished that already. Like this, it, the stuff we teach is so good. It's also a logical sort of step where it's like, so the $27 thing is like, do it completely on your own. The 197 thing is like, or the 97 is like, you get that stuff from the 27, but with some of my help, um, like basically templates of stuff. And then sure. the, the $5,000 thing is obviously like it's coaching. So like, we'll just basically do it for you. Um, and so like it, it, we're sort of speed running that, that same thing that people have been talking about for a while where it's like, 
do it yourself, done with you, done for you. That's like what Paul Email Wizard used to talk about. I remember on a podcast that you guys did a long time ago, he talked about that sort of logical step. So we have that going on. And um, I'm also just like trying to crank on every single I've been honestly kind of lazy with organic in the last few months. Like TikTok is kind of, I need to lay low on TikTok for a little bit as you know, <laughs> based on what happened recently. But um, dude, I, I had like, I hired this agency. I'm hiring a lot of people right now. Um, hired this agency for Instagram. The first video that they produced for me gained like 3,000 followers and it got 4.5 million views. Oh, you you were texting me about that. That was like the quickest you've grown in that short of a period of time, right? Oh, I have never in my life gained 3,000 followers in less than a month. Like it's, it's, it's doing its thing. Yeah, it's crazy. I'm looking it up. So um, they're killing it. And then um, new YouTube guys. Bro, I got a video dropping tomorrow. It's like something I kind of scripted and concepted myself, like something that I've been waiting to do for a really long time. It was like in the works since like March. Wow. It's a masterpiece, bro. It is a masterpiece. I cannot wait for you to see it. I'm so, stoked. I'm, again, it goes back to the thing that I, we talked about last week where it's like trying to make stuff beautiful just for beauty's sake. And I'm actually doing it. And I took that stuff seriously and like we're going on it. I'm also like, I'm back on Twitter, bro. I feel like Twitter is such a good place to like, push you know copywriting because like people already know this stuff like dude it's so hard to sell the idiots on tiktok or instagram not idiots but like normies um on twitter like people already know this stuff like they just need to be guided in the right direction so like twitter i feel like i really want more clients or students from twitter because they just know and it'd be so much easier to help them yeah same with linkedin so i'm, I'm investing a little bit in linkedin now i feel like um That'll be like a really solid place. We talked a little bit about this where it's just like, I want to get the W-2s. I want to get the people who are marketing for somebody else to learn what it's like to freelance, to learn from me. And I, dude, I just feel like yeah, I know between like the, the one and a half new channels that I'm focusing on now in, in LinkedIn and Twitter, Twitter's the half one where it's like, I've kind of been solid, but not really. And then ramping up on Instagram, ramping up on YouTube and then ads, we will... Like, dude, I'm so excited. I'm calling it November of this year, like Black Friday month. We're get we're gonna get very, very fucking close to a million in a month. I know we can yeah. do it. You got this. By the way, I found the video. I cannot believe how much how well this did. Um, looks like forty six thousand likes. You had eighty six hundred comments. Yeah, five thousand people. Looks like share it via DM. It's so funny. Um, like my one of my wife's best friend commented on it, which is weird. Um, like <laughs> she she commented like on it. The very first one I see it says "Copy me, lucky." And she was over at her house the other night. She does like um, like medical device sales or something. I, I I don't know why she's commenting on this, but like crazy how how well this did. And like how long is the video? Ten seconds? Twenty seconds? No, it's like one second. So that's okay, so like the views are a little inflated, but that's kind of the point. It was a trend apparently that they told me to hop on. They were like, do this before it burns out. And I was like, well, okay, let's see how it goes, bro. <laughs> like, John, the, so I'm basically watching it a ton of times, but it, it really is, ah, I see now, babe. Ah, yeah. So, so basically the fact that I'm, I keep looking at it and I'm reading it, that's why. But still, like, bro, that's crushed. No, I know. So like, I'm not really checking the views. Like, that's not the metric I care about. It's the fact that I've, I was at 88,000 followers on Friday and I'm now almost at 92,000. So, that's crazy. And was it was it through uh, was it many chat that like people like comment get auto DMs? Yeah, so they DM the word copy, dude. We had my DM setter, this poor kid. It was supposed to be his weekend. <laughs> I mean, he had a long week last week too, and now he's like, dude, he spent the entire weekend trying to Supplying. respond. Yeah, just like dude, because people people DM copy and then it's an auto responder, but then they ask more questions and then he has to set them on the calendar. So like, how many we, calls is that book? Huh, hundred. Hundreds of calls? How many calls to that video book? Well, I mean, it's, it's going to take some time, but I think from like since Friday, probably like 40 or 50 sets, which is a lot. That's a lot of sets. From a single video? Yeah. Dang, dude. All right, I'm pumped. Say this, bro. I'll say this. There's not many things I think I'm really good at, but for some reason, I'm really good at monetizing an audience. I keep meeting people that have like more followers than me on Instagram and they make more content but they don't, they're like, they're doing like a fifth of the numbers that we're doing and I can't understand it. 
And I think there's something about like, maybe it's the team I put together or maybe it's just like the way that the content is put together. Like that is my one strong suit, bro. Like I can monetize an audience. Like uh, we're small, but mighty. So I'm super excited about that. Yeah, I feel like you, I, I don't know how to put my, my point. Like, I don't know how to put my finger on it, but like, uh, I think it's a couple of things. I think one, like you're not afraid of looking stupid. I think a lot of people are like afraid of looking stupid. Um, and, and like with that, right? Like, I don't mean being aggressive in a bad way, but like, I feel like you're being aggressive, like, um, or like oppor opportunistic where like you have the right team and structure in place and you have, like, most people, I think, create organic content, but no one does anything from there. We're like, you're taking the next step where you're actually creating content that gets people to, to you know, raise their hand saying, you know, copy or basically them saying, I'm interested in learning more. You then give them the thing that you promised. And then on top of that, you then have someone in there that's like fielding questions, adding value and booking calls. So it's like, I think most people at every step of the funnel, like organic content, you know, hundred percent of people, you know, not hundred percent, but like, let's say 5% 5%, 10 people on Instagram create content. You know, so let's, let's just say that hundred percent of people creating content do organic, but very few people then do, you know, comment this and then auto DM, right? Now that's way less people doing that. And then the very last people, way less people do the whole setter thing, right? So it's just like each step that you're doing, you know, you're, you're basically in, inherently competing with like a fraction of a fraction of people because no one's willing to go to the length that you are. And that's why you're winning. It's because you're doing it the right way. People are lazy. People are forgetful. People are doing things passively. You're turning those passive interactions into active, engaged participants. Yeah, man. You're that's doing great. Like, I'm doing my best. I'm really doing my best. I really am. And I appreciate it, Chase. But I feel like it's a great, a great place to end it. What do you think? Heck yeah. Great episode. I'm excited for this one. Thanks, everybody, for watching. We will see you next week. Um, go follow Chase and I on all of our social platforms. I'm Cardinal Mason everywhere except Instagram where I'm Cardinal Mace. Check me out on LinkedIn, man. I might have a couple posts up by then. Heck yeah. Can't wait, bro. Cheers. All right. Bye-bye.